Number 1. On July 2, 1966, three friends Renee Brawl, 19, Patricia Blow, 19, and Ann Miller, 21, went to Indiana Dunes State Park in Chesterton, Indiana. The day started out when Ann left her home in her 1955 Buick, she went to go pick up the other two girls for their day out. First stop was Patricia's home. Before she left she told her mother she was going to be home early because Renee wanted to make dinner for her husband. The two then picked up Renee. By 8 a.m. they were on their way to the dunes from Illinois. It was already becoming a hot day. On their way to the dunes, they stopped by a drugstore and picked up a bottle of suntan lotion. They arrived at the park by 10 a.m., and it was already 88 degrees with light winds from the lake. It would get up to 92 degrees by noon. They parked the car in the parking lot and hiked to the lake. A couple who were also at the lake stated they saw the women leave their stuff on the beach and went into the lake together around noon. They also saw them talking to an unknown man operating a 14 to 16 feet white boat with a blue interior and an outboard motor. The women went onto the boat and headed west. Later that night the couple noticed that the women's stuff were still on the shore. They let a park ranger know that it was left by three women. The ranger assumed that the girls decided to go on a moonlight boat ride and would be back for their stuff later. It wasn't unheard of this happening. So he took the items to the office for safekeeping. The items were forgotten due to the busy weekend for the 4th of July. That was until Patricia's father called the office seeking information about the three girls. The ranger remembered the unclaimed items left by three women. They found car keys among the items and found that Anne's car was still there. Police was called and the women were reported missing. Searches ensued, but they and the unidentified man were not found. Renee left her large size towel, shorts, blouse, cigarettes, suntan lotion, 25 cents and her purse containing approximately $55 in checks on the beach. In her purse, there was a note stating she wanted to leave her husband, but it's believed it was written in anger possibly during a fight. Her family didn't believe she really wanted to leave her husband, and he didn't think there were any huge issues in their relationship either. Patricia left her yellow robe, sunglasses, a transistor radio, a white print towel and her wallet containing $5 on the beach. Anne left her denim shorts, a polo shirt, shoes, a white bathing cap, a comb and her thermos bottle on the beach. Some came forward and stated they saw the women after the couple had. The initial sightings of the trio were the most reliable. A lot of witnesses stated the girls got onto a white boat with a man. Some accounts described the man in his early 20s, tan and with wavy dark hair, and were wearing a beach jacket. Someone who was filming home movies that turned over their video in case it was useful for them. On the footage, two boats were narrowed down a 16 to 18 feet long Drumrin runabout, with a three-hull design driven by a man that fit the description, and three women matching the trio's description. The second boat seen was a 26 to 28 feet long Trojan cabin cruiser, with three men aboard, along with three women. The cabin cruiser may have had a radio telephone antenna and not painted name on the side. This one was seen around 3 p.m. three hours after they were seen in the smaller boat. It's believed the women were dropped off on the shore and the man left them to get the other two men and the bigger boat. The three were reportedly seen eating and walking along with the sand dews around this time and were seen with another unidentified man and they went onto the bigger boat with him and the other two. Nothing showed up and the man the women were last seen with never came forward. At the time there was evidence of a boat wreck near Bailey Generating Station of Northern Indiana Public Service Company on Lake Michigan. But it's unknown if the boat wreck involved the girls, and the boat was never reported missing wrecked. The girls were said to have been strong swimmers, but accidental drowning was not ruled out either. It could be possible that the girls had met foul play, and rumors spread around about why. It was known that Anne was three months pregnant and that Patricia could have possibly been pregnant and the girls went to the beach to meet up with someone who could do abortions on them. Some believe that something went wrong during one and the three were killed and disposed of. This theory was never proven. Ralph Largo Jr. matched the unknown man's description. His aunt and uncle performed illegal abortions at the time. It's not proven he was the man though. The girls at this time were horse enthusiasts and frequented tricolor stables in Palatine, Illinois. It's possible that Patricia and Anne had connections or knew people in the criminal horse market. The tricolor stables were owned by George Jane. He and his brother Silas were in a bitter argument about the horse argument. In June 1965 Cheryl Ann Rood was killed in a car bombing at the stables when she moved George's Cadillac for him. It's believed that Silas was involved, and in 1997 James Bladio was charged in the bombing. 
it's possible that one of the girls witnessed a bombing. Patricia acquired a facial injury, possibly from a punch, in March. She stated she got it from syndicate horse people. George and Silas's phone numbers were discovered in the belongings of one of the girls. Late George was killed from a gunshot wound in 1970, and Silas was convicted in the conspiracy in his brother's murder. Silas died in 1987, but is suspected in the disappearance of Helen Bratch. It has never been proven that he had anything to do with the girl's disappearance. Silas did state at one point he had three bodies under his residence. Renee is a white female and was 19 at the time of her disappearance. Her maiden name was Slineko, she's 5'9 and 120 to 150 pounds. She has brown hair and hazel eyes. At the time she was wearing a brown swimsuit with green flowers and gold leaves. Patricia went by Pat and Patty. She is a white female and was 19 years old at the time. She's 5'4 and 114 pounds. She has brown hair and brown eyes. She was possibly pregnant at the time. She was wearing a bright yellow swimsuit with ruffles. Anne is a white female and 21 years old at the time. She was 5'2 and her weight was unknown. She has brown hair and blue eyes. She may have been three months pregnant, but it isn't for sure. She was wearing a blue two-piece bathing suit with a red belt. Number 2 the Sarah Joe was a 17-foot motorboat that then 20-something Robert Malayakini acquired in the 1970s. He named it after Mom Sarah and Dad Joe. The name Sarah Joe is also linked to one of the greatest tragedies and mysteries to arise from Hana. The boat took five strong, healthy, young Hana men out to sea 40 years ago Monday. It would eventually return to Hana after more than a decade and over 4,000 miles, but the men would not. What happened to the men aboard remains part fact and part fiction. It's a tale retold by outsiders around this time yearly, and a story that's lived daily by generations of people residing in East Maui. The Sarah Joe changed the lives of five families forever, and rocked a small tight-knit town where even decades later, residents rely on house visits instead of technology to connect with neighbors. Sitting around a table to talk story Friday afternoon in Malayakini's garage are three generations of East Maui residents representing three of the five men. Siblings of the men lost at sea are now in their 60s and 70s, their children are middle-aged adults, and their grandchildren attend elementary school. The five men Ralph Malayakini, 27, Scott Mormon, 27, Benjamin Kalama, 38, Patrick Wozner, 26, and Peter Hanchett, 31, are memorialized on t-shirts worn by some, and they're the subject of discussions that draw reflection, laughter and some tearing up, leading to the 40th anniversary of their disappearance at sea. Robert is Ralph's twin brother, Ralph was ahead by 15 minutes. Michael and brother Patrick were close too, only 16 months apart. One got the blue pajamas, and the other got the red Michael said with a laugh. Yulu Helikahi was Benjamin Benny Kalama's wife. His adult daughters, Tammy and Nicole, are there too, along with some of the Kalama and Malayakini grandkids. Their stories are the subject of international intrigue. Sarah Jo has been documented in Unsolved Mysteries podcasts, Reddit threads, YouTube videos, news reports, a local documentary and more. Family members on Friday said they are not riddled by the Sarah Jo mystery, in the same way that others may be, though. It's all speculation Michael Wozner said. Everyone has their own thoughts on it. The thing is that they didn't come back. They're gone. Sarah Jo leaves February 11, 1979. What's not up for guesswork is the weather on February 11, 1979. Family members vividly recall the morning Ralph Malayakini borrowed the Sarah Joe, which was only a year or two old, from his brother, and the crew of five co-worker friends skipped out on a nearby construction job to go fishing instead. It was a perfect, beautiful morning Halakah, he said. The sea looked like a lake Robert Malayakini added. Without many supplies, the five piled into the small craft, which had an 85-horsepower engine, and set out mid-morning from Hana Bay boat ramp. Helikahi said her husband wasn't really a fisherman, but the group was strong and healthy, and all had water experience of swimming, surfing, diving and paddling. By 1 p.m. the wind increased to a gale. By evening the squall was chaos Malekini said. Helikahi recalls being on Hana Pier, searching the horizon for her husband. She called the police that afternoon, and the U.S. Coast Guard was notified. A group of Hana men went out to search that night on larger boats. Some reported their vessel going vertical in 40-foot waves, according to a Maui news story published in 2009. I'm in the ocean all the time, and that was the roughest I have ever seen, it Robert Malayakini said. Plus the Alenyuhaha is one of the roughest channels in the world. When Robert Malayakini searched via boat the following day near the Big Island, he said, he met John Naughton, 
a National Marine Fisheries Service researcher. He asked Naughton and anyone nearby to look for the missing Sarah Jo. The Coast Guard called off its search after about five days. A massive community search via land, air and water ensued. People combed the coastlines of neighboring islands. The Hana community rallied. Days and weeks passed. It seemed like when rain 40 days and 40 nights after that day, said Nicole Kalama Baker, who was eight when her dad disappeared. With no word of Sarah Jo, years passed. Then a strange turn of events brought everything back nearly a decade later. Discovery in the Marshall Islands. In 1988, Naughton, who helped with the immediate search, was doing research on Teongi Atoll in the northern part of the Marshall Islands, located about 2,200 miles southwest of Hawaii. He spotted an embattled boat with a Hawaii registry on the hull, and later said he immediately thought of the Sarah Joe, but could hardly believe it, according to the Maui News report. It was later confirmed to be the missing vessel. Bones were found buried nearby in a simple grave on the atoll, which tests revealed later to be those of Mormon. The grave was covered with stones and a cross made out of driftwood. Nearby was what looked like a blank pad of notepaper interleaved with aluminum foil. The news of the discovery was like opening up a can of worms for Michael Wozner. It appeared that the boat and Mormon had made it there, but that raised a whole new set of questions, he said. It was happy, but sad Helica, he said. It brought everything back. Dot 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 you figure one body is buried there so you figure you would find more. In 1989, television's Unsolved Mysteries recreated the Sarah Joe story, with many from the Hana search party portraying themselves. People hoped publicity would draw out information about the bones of the boat. In 1990, Robert Malayakini, along with friend and former TV host Hari Kajima of Let's Go Fishing and Hawaii private investigator Steve Goodenow, traveled to the atoll to conduct their own search. Goodenow theorized that Chinese fishers could have found Mormon's body, but did not tell anyone because they were fishing there illegally, a 2009 Honolulu Star Bulletin report said. The notepaper symbolizes good luck in the afterlife for some in China and Taiwan, but the cross is not part of that culture, Michael Wozner said. Robert Malayakini said returning home and answering questions from the other families, who had hope after the Sarah Joe discovery, was one of the hardest times for him. Seeing what I did, it was too difficult of a journey he said, flipping through pictures of the Marshall Islands trip. It's too far to survive. Some believe Mormon was alive when Sarah Joe reached the atoll. Others believed he tied himself to the boat to weather the storm, dying before he reached land. In Hana, the stories of what happened between Hana Bay and the Marshall Islands are vast and varied, including psychics telling family members which crewmates fell overboard first. The more challenging tales come from the children, Robert's wife, Patricia Malayakini, said. They ask, what if my papa came back? She said. Some ask, what if grandpa has other kids? That's the hard part. There are so many layers and so many lives involved. The Coast Guard returned Sarah Joe to its original owner in the early 90s. With numbers, name and paint too faded to see, it sits at the start of Robert Malayakini's driveway, a daily reminder that they're there the twin brother said. With the 40th anniversary Monday, the Hana men live on in the blood of surviving relatives and in the water of Hana Bay and beyond, which reminds Kanaka Maoli of nature, sustenance, travel, life cycles, something bigger and more spiritual. Each year, a Sarah Joe tribute canoe paddle is held by Hana Canoe Club, this year it's slated for May. Some family members memorialize the men on their birthdays. Others add flowers to the Hana Bay Memorial on the anniversaries of their disappearance. For the 30th anniversary and public luau, which was closure the group said, some planted five Norfolk pine trees, one for each man, to the right of the cross above Hana Town. You can only see four from the hotel, but if you look from the store, you can see all five, Robert Malayakini said. Even though they were lost at sea, it didn't change our relationship with the ocean, Michael Wozner said. The Nahiku resident added that he thinks often of the good things, of a group of friends who like to have fun, and of the strength of the Hana community who took his family in as its own. I think of them every day and remember them when I say my rosary helica, he said. Robert Malayakini still goes fishing weekly from Hana Bay on a boat named Kuu Manukai, in honor of Sarah Joe's memorial song, written by Parley Kanakaol, and put to music by Brother Nolan Conjugation. To him, he said, the ocean represents home. Number 3 The tiny village of Silver Plume, Colorado population 200 lies in the heart of the Rocky Mountains. On September 7, 1987, Tom Young closed up his bookshop on Main Street and along with his dog, Gus, disappeared. Nine months later, a new resident of Silver Plume, Keith Reinhardt, opened an antique shop at exactly the same location. 
On August 7, 1988, Keith closed up his shop for the day. Less than two hours later, Keith Reinhardt also disappeared. There were just too many coincidences. Keith Reinhardt and Tom Young both rented the same store. They both left town promising to return. Strangest of all, Keith was writing a book about Tom's disappearance when he too suddenly vanished. Keith Reinhardt moved to Silver Plume from Chicago with three goals. To get in shape by mountain climbing, to overcome his fear of heights, and to begin writing a novel. During his sabbatical, Keith wanted to try running an antique shop geared toward summer tourists. If it was successful, he hoped he and his wife could relocate there permanently. Keith's old friend, Ted Parker, ran a cafe in Silver Plume at the time of Keith's disappearance. Keith Reinhardt and I grew up across the street from one another. And we'd known each other about 40 years. I would say that our relationship was similar to that of brothers. Keith was apprehensive and excited about turning 50. He was here to finish out the last of his 40s in the way that he dreamed of. Nine months earlier, Keith's antique shop had been a bookstore. Tom Young, the man who mysteriously disappeared with his dog, had run the store for about a year. Tom had told people he was taking a vacation to Europe. Three weeks went by before anyone became suspicious about his absence. Keith Reinhardt became obsessed by the unexplained disappearance and began talking to everyone in Silver Plume who had known Tom. Eventually, Keith decided to base his novel on Tom Young. When he began to write, he created a character named Guy Gypsum, a composite of himself and Tom. According to his daughter, Tiffany, sometimes it seemed hard for Keith to tell the difference between fact and fiction. Writers like to live the story they're writing about, get a feel of it, so it's easier for them to write about it. Maybe my father, it's always possible, wanted to feel what it's like to disappear so he could write about it. On July 31, 1988, ten months after Tom Young disappeared, two hunters found the remains of Tom and his dog in the mountains near Silver Plume. Each had died from a bullet wound to the head. Dave Doenhor of the Clear Creek County Sheriff's Department was one of the first investigators to arrive on the scene. They were up there exploring some territory for the bow hunting season which was coming up, and they found his remains. Also found at the scene was a revolver. In subsequent investigation, we found out that Tom had purchased a gun approximately four days before he was last known to be in Silver Plume. The Tom Young case is closed and it has been ruled a suicide both by the coroner's office and by the Clear Creek County Sheriff's Department. Keith was writing a novel about Tom. One week after Tom's body was found, Keith walked through Silver Plume, telling everyone he saw that he was going to climb to the top of nearby Pendleton Mountain. One of his stops was Ted Parker's cafe. He was in the cafe and told me he was going to make it to the top of the mountain. If I don't come back, call on the rescue and he said that in jest, I felt. I have this picture of him pointing to the mountain and saying goodbye. That was the last time I saw him. Keith was last seen walking toward Pendleton Mountain at 4.30 in the afternoon, far too late in the day to begin a difficult six-hour hike. That night, Keith Reinhardt did not return. The next day, helicopters were called to search the mountain. On the ground, more than 125 men and a dozen trained dogs combed the difficult terrain for seven days. Charlie Shemansky headed the Alpine rescue team. The Reinhard search was like looking for the proverbial needle in a haystack. This haystack is 3,000 vertical feet of 60-degree slope. This was about as difficult a search terrain as we cover. We were at a real disadvantage because Keith went into the mountains wearing no more than blue jeans and a flannel shirt and tennis shoes. He had no backpack. He had no equipment. A typical subject of a search will leave lots of clues for us to trace. Keith didn't leave many clues. He didn't have many with him to leave behind. Both men owned a shop at the same location. In 30 years of operation, the Colorado Alpine rescue teams had found every single person they searched for. However, they discovered no trace of Keith Reinhardt. Some have concluded that Keith Reinhardt and Tom Young were murdered, noting that both men rented the same space to run their shops. Perhaps, they both came across information someone didn't want them to know. Another theory is that Keith planned his own disappearance. However, Carolyn Reinhardt disagreed with that theory. I don't think that Keith would be the type of person to walk away from his whole entire life and leave it behind him. He loved the people in his life. He loved keeping in touch with them. And I don't think he could have left them all behind him. Some of Keith Reinhardt's friends recall that he was fascinated by the idea of visiting West Virginia. Also, Keith attended a party the night before he disappeared. Witnesses say he spent a good deal of time talking to a woman named Greta or Gretchen, who is probably from Denver. Police would like to talk to her. 
They hope she can remember something he said that would yield a clue to his whereabouts, if indeed he is still alive. Number 4. The search for answers continues 24 years after a young KIMT TV anchor disappeared outside her Mason City apartment. Jody Yacentruit, a 27 year old Minnesota native, didn't show up for her 6 a.m. broadcast June 27, 1995, and was never heard from again. With a recent CBS special and billboard campaign, Yacentruit has been kept in the public eye thanks to friends, family, and others interested in the cold case. Six months after the disappearance, the Des Moines Register reported there were no solid suspects, despite an extensive police search. Today, despite investigating several people of interest over the years, police still don't have a main suspect. The fear that Jody Hucentruit's abduction stirs is widely shared, a 1995 Des Moines Register article said. Women's vulnerability to crime is well understood, though not talked about much, perhaps because it's a fact of life, however abhorred, and because it is usually harassment or robbery or rape, but not a disappearance into thin air. After years of false hope over potential suspects and discovered bodies, those who knew Jody Hucentruit stay hopeful that one day their questions will be answered. Who is Jody Hucentruit? Jody Yacentruit, who was 27 years old at the time of her disappearance, was a Minnesota native who graduated from St. Cloud State University. She was an avid skier and moved to Mason City to become the morning and noon anchorwoman two years before her disappearance. The morning of her disappearance, Yacentruit answered a call from a KIMT TV producer. She said she had overslept and was going to head into the office. The producer called again at 5 a.m. with no response before co-workers requested police to perform a welfare check at her apartment. Police believed she was grabbed as she tried to unlock her red Mazda Miata, shortly after 4 a.m. a hair dryer, a red pair of shoes and a bottle of hairspray were found next to her car at her apartment complex. A palm print was on the car, and police found signs of a struggle. There's nothing I'd rather do in my life right now than bring closure to the family, Mason City Police Sergeant Frank Stearns told the Register in 2005. You just can't let it go. It becomes a part of you. Jody Yacentruit would have celebrated her 51st birthday this year. Carolyn Lowe, a former crime reporter, wrote on findjody.com that despite hope from last year's nationwide coverage of the billboard campaign, another year passes with little information about her information. Jody Hisentruit should be celebrating her 51st birthday today with her friends and loved ones, Lowe wrote. Instead, they mark another year not knowing what happened to Jody since she was abducted on June 27, 1995, from her apartment parking lot in Mason City, Iowa, on her way to anchor the news at KIMT TV. Though leads have come in slowly over the past 24 years, Jeff Brinkley, the fourth Mason City police chief since the disappearance, told CBS's 48 Hours he is optimistic they will find some answers. I think that we're very close, the former Ames police lieutenant said of a break in the case. I don't think it's coming fast. He did not specify what other evidence police were reviewing besides the items found outside her apartment building. What happened after her disappearance? She was declared legally dead in 2001. No one has been charged in her death, though police and family have not given up. In the 2005 article, family speculated over what they think happened to Yacentruit. Her mother, Jane Yacentruit, said she thinks her daughter is at the bottom of a lake near her home. Her cousin, Mary Lee Mauberg, said she thinks a man stalked Jody Yacentruit. Nothing adds up, Mauberg said, besides something like a stalker. Some twisted person mentally. CBS's 48 Hours featured the case in December, revealing new details of the case and footage, including police interviews with John Vances, a friend of Hucentruit, who is believed to be the last person to have seen her before she vanished. In March 2018, Mason City Police executed search warrants for cars belonging to Vances. He is 20 years older than Hucentruit and may have had an infatuation with her. Jim Axelrod, who hosted 48 Hours, went to Vances's Arizona home to get a comment about the case, but Vances gruffly declined. Tony Jackson, who is serving prison time for a string of Minnesota rapes during the 1990s, was also featured during the special. He was living in Mason City when Hucentru had disappeared. Mason City police said he was not a viable suspect a few years after the disappearance. Jackson declined an interview with 48 Hours, but maintained his innocence through an email. He would not confirm or deny whether he was still a suspect. Family, friends and others interested in the case have kept momentum alive for the past 24 years. Four billboard with her face and the words, somebody knows something. Is it you? Were erected around the Mason City area last year. Findjody.com regularly updates, with several articles posted some months.
Each year, as the case remains unsolved, tributes to the blonde news anchor with a Manesitan accent and a contagious smile are posted to the website. Through times of no leads and false hope, the search for Jody Hucentrud continues. Number 5 in 2015, the horrifying discovery of an Indiana University student's dead body seemed like a break in the case of another student whose earlier disappearance had baffled investigators for years. Hannah Wilson, 22, had been missing for mere hours when her body was discovered on April 24, 2015, in a grassy vacant lot about 10 miles from the Bloomington campus. Almost immediately, authorities drew comparisons to Lauren Spire, an outgoing 20-year-old fashion student at the university, who vanished in the early hours of June 3, 2011. Among the eerily similar circumstances cited by an investigator, Wilson's body turned up hours after her friends said they last saw her leaving Kilroy's sports bar, the same downtown Bloomington hangout visited by Spire or before Spire or disappeared. But while a man, Daniel Messel, was later charged and convicted for Wilson's murder, the mystery of Spirer's fate continues to haunt her family, her friends and police who have never formally named a suspect, and insist they've never backed off in their search for answers about what happened to her. Eight years after Lauren's disappearance and we are no closer to finding her or getting answers, her mother, Charlene, wrote on the family's official Facebook page on the most recent anniversary last June. The expression, the more things change the more they stay the same seems apropos. We continue living in the past and in the present. No one escapes this life unscathed, she wrote. Everyone has struggles and somehow, we all survive, but it is not without costs. As every June 3rd approaches, I am faced with the dread of reliving all the horrific minutes of that day and the days which followed. I now know of course, despite how desperately I wanted to believe the words we will find her, it just wasn't meant to be. Our timeline has no end. The parallels between Spire and Wilson caught the attention of many. Wilson's friends told investigators she had been partying in a hotel room before walking with friends to Kilroy's. According to a criminal affidavit, witnesses said that after an intoxicated Wilson reached the bar, she got into a green and white cab alone, her fare was paid in full at the curb, and she gave the driver her address. It was the last time her friends saw her. The coroner concluded that she had been struck three to four times in the back of the head and died from blunt force trauma. Prosecutors at Messel's trial said Wilson's blood and hair were found in his Kia Sportage, and his cell phone was recovered near her body. Prosecutor Ted Adams also noted Messel's eight prior convictions for violent behavior. In September 2016, a judge sentenced Messel to 60 years in prison for Wilson's murder, plus 20 years as a habitual criminal offender. Then, in April 2018, Messel was given an additional 15-year sentence after he pleaded guilty to battery resulting in bodily injury in an unrelated 2012 case involving another 22-year-old Indiana University student who told police that Messel abducted, beat and sexually assaulted her. In Spire's still unresolved case, her disappearance followed a night of partying that included an early morning stop with friends at the sports bar. Afterward, she visited a friend's off-campus apartment but left around 4.30 a.m. to walk a short distance home. She never made it. Her determined parents, Charlene and Robert, publicly battled with several young men who were with Lauren at various points in her last known hours, each of whom quickly acquired lawyers, and the Spirers have long maintained they don't believe Lauren's disappearance was a random abduction. They also say that, despite the surface similarities, they were told by members of law enforcement that nothing linked Wilson's case to their daughters. The not knowing is almost unbearable Charlene Spire wrote on Facebook last June. Over the course of these last eight years we have tried our hardest to get answers, but the brutal truth, the only truth, is that any resolution depends on someone willing to come forward with information. She added. To those responsible, you've moved on, but we have not. We will never give up. There is always someone actively working to find you. Someone is always looking for you. How ironic, just as we are looking for Lauren, we are just as diligently looking for you. I have to believe that someday you will let your guard down. You will need to share your truth, and it will just be too big for the person you've told to keep it to themselves. That is what we hope for. Number 6 on April 17, 2005, a small headline appeared in the corner of the front page of the Susquehanna Valley Daily Item. Center County DA missing. The story continued inside the paper, briefly outlining a developing case. Police searched the land and air in central Pennsylvania for any sign of a car driven by Center County's top prosecutor, who was reported missing Saturday after he failed to return home from a drive the day before read the article. 
The prosecutor, Ray Greicher, had awoken on Friday, April 15, and told his girlfriend, Patty Fornicola, that he would be skipping work that day to enjoy a drive down to Lewisburg. It was one of the first warm days of the year, and Greicher told Fornicola he was hoping to enjoy the weather. By early the next day, his red Mini Cooper was found by a state trooper in the parking lot of the Street of Shops, about 50 miles from his home in Bellefont, Pa. Many witnesses reported seeing or speaking to Greicher on Market Street. His phone, turned off, was found within the car. However, his laptop, wallet, and car keys were not. Now, 13 years later, the question of what happened to Greicher that sunny Friday in Lewisburg still remains. Born in Cleveland, Ohio, Ray Greicher had served as the Pennsylvania Center Court District Attorney from 1985 to 2005. The twice-divorced father of one was set to retire in a few months, just in time for his 60th birthday. During his tenure, Greicher had specialized in cases of homicide. Greicher prosecuted many notable cases, included the perpetrator of the Hetzel Union building shooting, in which a woman opened fire with a rifle at Penn State in 1996, killing one student and wounding another. In 1998, Greicher declined to press charges against the infamous Jerry Sandusky. The longtime Penn State assistant football coach was charged and convicted with 40 counts of child sex abuse in 2011. Some believe that Greicher declined to press charges against Sandusky in order to avoid having to tackle such a hometown legend. However, Anthony DeBove, who had worked as an assistant district attorney under Greicher for five years, strongly disagrees. No one got a buy with Ray. He didn't care who you were, he had a job to do. Greicher's daughter, Lara, issued a plea for her father at a news conference three days after his disappearance. I want more than anything to hear your voice and for you to hug me. Maybe we can go for a hike, go hike up a mountain and sit and talk. Please call. Visibly emotional, she also addressed the public, to everyone else out there, if you have seen my father, please contact police. Within the week the FBI was called in to assist with the investigation. Divers searched the Susquehanna River while helicopters covered both land and water from above. In July, Greicher's laptop, which was missing its hard drive, was pulled from the water under the PA 45 bridge between Lewisburg and Milton, PA. The hard drive was found months later by a fisherman on the bank near the old railway bridge, which runs parallel to the traffic bridge. The hard drive was too damaged to be read. Greicher's wallet and keys were not found. From the motorcycle gang Hell's Angels to Greicher's own girlfriend, the police explored many possible suspects over the course of the investigation. Yet an official suspect was never identified. On April 22, the Bucknellian reported that an anonymous donor had promised a $5,000 reward for information regarding Greicher's whereabouts. It is unclear whether the money was ever awarded to anyone. The case has been the subject of many television documentary programs including Dateline NBC and CBS's Without a Trace. While his body has not been found, Greicher was declared legally dead on July 25, 2011. However, the Pennsylvania State Police consider the case to be open and active. These type of cases are unique, and you have to think outside of the box Sunbury Police Chief Miller said in January of 2017. You have to make noise and let the dust settle. It is then when you can possibly get answers. With a click of a button, the media can reach thousands and go places we as police can't go. I wish all the investigators luck in solving the case of Ray Greicher. Number 7 How can someone go into a second-story bar and never come out? I'm talking about the disappearance of Brian Schaefer in 2006. On March 31, Schaefer and his friend William Clint Florence went out to Ugly Tuna to celebrate the beginning of spring break. Schaefer was a second-year medical student and surely wanted to cut loose a bit after a stressful week of exams. The two then barhopped down High Street towards the Arena District, reportedly taking shots at every stop. A little after midnight, Schaefer and Florence met up with a friend of Florence named Meredith, who gave them a ride back to Ugly Tuna. The three of them are seen on security camera ascending the escalator to the now-closed bar in the University Gateway around 1.15 a.m. on April 1. Later, the camera captures Schaefer outside the bar talking to two women around 1.50 a.m. and then re-entering the bar. At this point, Schaefer was separated from his friends. The bar was closing and after searching and calling for Schaefer, Florence and Meredith decided to wait outside the bar for him to come out. After a while, the two left, assuming Schaefer had gone home. But, the 27-year-old has never been seen or heard from since. Ugly Tuna had one entrance at the top of the escalator. Anyone entering or leaving from this would be caught on surveillance cameras. 
Investigators acknowledge the possibility that the cameras could have somehow missed Schaefer, though think it's unlikely. Another improbably scenario they've entertained is Schaefer disguising himself and or hiding from the cameras before exiting the bar. After all, the quality of security cameras circa 2006 was not the highest. There was only one other way that Brian could have exited the bar that night, and it was from a back service door. Not only was this a door used exclusively by staff members, but it also opened to a construction site that would have posed a dangerous situation for a sober person, let alone someone who had been drinking all night. It's also important to note neither Schaefer's cell phone, credit cards, or bank account have been used since. The young man's disappearance sparked an international search effort. Possible sightings started flowing in from Michigan, Texas, and even as far as Sweden. Eddie Vedder, the lead singer of Pearl Jam, one of Schaefer's favorite bands and motivation for a tattoo, even took time out of the band's set in Cincinnati to put out a call for information that may lead to Schaefer's discovery. Schaefer received excellent marks from the university, was close with his family who lived in Pickerington, and had a good relationship with his girlfriend, Alexis Wagoner. He and Wagoner had a spring break trip to Miami booked confirming plans with her over the phone around 9 p.m. on March 31. She, along with their families and friends, were convinced Schaefer would probably propose later that year or maybe even on their trip to Miami. For months after his disappearance, Wagoner called his phone every night. It went straight to voicemail every time except one night in September when she heard the phone ring three times. There was no answer, but the call pinged a tower in Hilliard. There was hope for the first time in months. Unfortunately, the cellular carrier divulged that the rings were likely a glitch in the system, rather than Schaefer powering on his phone. Everyone in Schaefer's life agreed to take a polygraph test in order to clear them of any suspicion, except Florence. Reportedly, Florence refused the test because he felt he had told police everything he knew about the night Schaefer disappeared. By all accounts, he was the all-American boy with everything to live, for which is why his disappearance has been so troubling all these years. If you have any information regarding the disappearance of Brian Schaefer, please contact the Central Ohio Crime Stoppers at 614-645-8477, if requested you will remain anonymous. Additional information. Prior to his disappearance, Schaefer's mother Renee died of a rare form of bone cancer called melodysplasia. And just after his disappearance, his father died in a freak accident involving a windstorm and a tree branch. The immediate Schaefer family is survived only by Brian's younger brother Derek.